And as we all know, music certainly matters. There are many business parallels between music and online entertainment. Music plays a major part in what's happening in digital entertainment globally, after being at the leading, bleeding edge, and now moving forward. Michael Nash will share his insight about the music industry, digital entertainment, and digital next steps. And joining him on stage is Rob Lewis. Please welcome Michael Nash of Warner Music Group and Rob Lewis, Omniphone Group Limited. Gentlemen. Thanks for the introduction. So we, um, we had a brief chat behind stage and uh, we thought we might talk today about a kind of a real trend that's taking place, a mega trend we might call it in the marketplace, in the music industry, which is this idea of cloud services. Um, and this is something that's going to clearly come to all walks of digital entertainment, music, film, TV, ebooks, everything. Um, but clearly it's coming to music first for lots of obvious reasons and Michael, um, who I think most of you here probably know, kind of runs the digital business for one of the world's most important record labels, Warner Music, is clearly having to contend with this ahead of a lot of other industries. So, Michael, perhaps you could give us a bit of insight. There's a, there's a bit of confusion in the market as to kind of what a cloud service really means, what does that mean for a consumer, and and kind of the different types of cloud service. Could you give us a bit of insight on that? Yeah, I think that's a good place to start. Um, I, I'm sure that most of you have heard the term, the cloud, so often that you share the view that it, it's maybe the most overhyped buzzword of the last year. But I think when you separate the hype from the reality, what you're left with is a very, very important paradigm shift that represents a moment of opportunity for the entertainment business. So I'm gonna throw out a couple of generalities and then attempt to defend them. The migration to the cloud is definitely a mega trend. The music industry is certainly leading the way. And I think that there's been an unnecessary um, part of the dialogue that has focused on creating false dichotomies about access versus ownership. And I think it's important to see the interconnection of these things. So to defend um, th those statements, why is the consumer migration to the cloud a megatrend. It's basic Moore's law. Over the course of the next decade, the total amount of data that exists in the digital universe is gonna increase by about 40 times. That's the forecast. That's an explosion of data. There's no way that that's gonna be properly managed with pockets of information sitting on disconnected hard drive devices. You're gonna need some unifying organizing constructs in order to make that much information useful and navigable for consumers. So how is that going to happen? One of the most important principles that you have to keep in mind is 75% of all the data in the digital universe is a copy of something. So this idea of deduplication is really key to obtaining efficiencies through cloud services. And that's why music content is gonna be first. Because if you think about what forms of content are currently sitting on people's hard drives that need to be cloud service, there's documents, there's photos, and then there's music. So the number one form of content that can be deduplicated in a cloud service is music content. And that's why there's been such a focus on music with respect to the cloud. So but essentially what we're talking about uh, is essentially the idea that everywhere I go, it could be on my phone, on my PC, in my car, on my TV, I've got access to the same music collection. It kind of follows me around. My playlists follow me around. My tracks, my favorite artists follow me around. Um, but there's clearly there's kind of three types of service that there are right now today. There's, there's at the high end, there's kind of access models that give consumers not just access to their collection, but all the music in the world and then that follows them around. There's, there's license lockers that allow consumers, because they're working with you as an industry, to, to be able to get new stuff as well as to actually be able to send data up to the cloud very quickly. And there's also, quite controversially, there's some unlicensed services that have been rolled out, particularly Google and Amazon in the US, where they haven't even done business with you. They've just launched a service where they keep all the cash. So what do you kind of see as the differences between these services? What, what's actually going to work for the consumer? Before offering a few thoughts, I, I, I'm sure that others in the audience are thinking 
Rob Lewis could actually be on the other side <laughs> of this particular interview answering a lot of those questions. I, I think that the, uh, the depth of your questions reflects um, your, your, your background and, and perspective. Um, I, and I, I think that those are really are, are the issues. I said before there's some false dichotomies that people present. Um, you know, people talk about jukebox versus locker. They talk about access versus ownership, downloads versus streaming. Some people say, well, the locker is going to be the death of uh, subscription or access kills ownership. I, I think that's a very simplistic view. The jukebox in the sky proposition has been around for a while. That's really the first form of cloud service. So some people say, well, why is the cloud so important? Because the, the jukebox in the sky, the unlimited on-demand subscription service proposition hasn't really taken off. Well, in fact, it is starting to take off and we're seeing some very interesting growth, but a lot of consumers might not start there. A lot of our best customers have amassed very significant digital music collections, track by track, album by album, and that's what they really care most about. It represents for many of them, not all of them, a lot of money, but for all of them it represents a lot of time and it represents what they love, what they care about. So the proposition that my music collection can be backed up, instantly uploaded, available in the cloud to all of my domain, all the devices in my personal domain, and that I can have a standardized level of quality associated with that content, and I have the opportunity to add new content and have it instantly available on all my devices. That is a very attractive proposition. So for consumers, the idea of the cloud's not an abstraction, it basically fixes things that are broken in the digital ecosystem. And any of you out there that have experienced a hard drive crash and have lost your music collection, you know the pain that goes with that, so you understand this is not an abstraction for consumers. So, we see the locker as a, as a logical proposition. Our research shows it's a mass market proposition. That's confirmed by independent research for, for those obvious reasons. But that doesn't mean that the locker is somehow competitive with subscription. We think that once you migrate consumers to the cloud through their collection, you get them used to the idea of virtual ownership. They learn to trust access. There's a very logical upsell path to unlimited on-demand subscription. Yeah. And I so mean, uh, clearly, I think we'd both agree, I think most of the people here would agree that the great thing about a subscription service is also is you can discover new stuff, not just access the stuff you already love. And a lot of consumers love discovering stuff as much as they love loving the stuff they love. But if we just go back to unlicensed lockers for a second, I mean, if you speak, there's a few artists here who are kind of perhaps a little bit concerned that their music label and therefore them directly are not getting any royalties from these services that are being launched. I mean, how do you see bringing people who want to bring locker services to market like Google, like Amazon, they're only US driven at the moment, but how is the music industry going to try and make services better or bring those kind of organizations into the fold? So you're right that some companies have rushed into the marketplace with unlicensed services. Um, they're, they're described not pejoratively, but, but just you know, based on their limitations as, as dumb lockers. They're basically hard drives in the sky. Yeah. Let me tell you why I don't think that that's going to be the end state of the cloud and, and why I think that the marketplace is, is going to address this problem. You've got some very important features that mean a lot to consumers that make a licensed locker proposition much better. One of the obvious ones is upload. For an unlicensed locker service, you have to actually manually upload file by file the entire content collection. Okay. Depending on the quality of your broadband, depending on the size of your collection, that's hours, days, weeks. If you're an early adopter and you've got 20,000, 30,000 tracks, um, don't hold your breath. Okay, this is a, this is a, a yeah. huge, huge hurdle to adoption for the services. A licensed locker creates a database in the cloud of all available content scans the hard drive, matches the personal collection to the licensed um, database, and then makes that content instantly available. So you... So it can take minutes rather than days. Yeah. Ba I mean, ba so it's clearly a better user experience. So yeah? you, you, so, and so, you, so you've instantly uploaded the collection virtually and made it available on all the registered devices in the personal domain. So that's a much better consumer proposition. So if, that, if that's so much better, why would a company like Google or Amazon or some of these unlicensed lockers companies actually roll out a, a product that's so substandard, do you think? It's difficult to speculate <laughs> on the motives of, uh, of, of companies that, that are our partners. I think that you know, uh, there, there's some pressure to, to be first to market and establish a market position. Whatever that motivation was, I think at the end of the day, you look at the upload barrier, you look at the enhancement that the licensed service can offer in terms of standardized quality, 
quality yeah. of the audio, correct album artwork, pristine metadata. When you look at the ability to automatically integrate new purchases to the, yeah. the cloud service and make that content available, when you look at other associated features, and you consider that there's a cost to the locker, to, to, to the storage on the back end, if you yeah. don't have a database, we just think it makes a lot more sense to devote the resources to the licenses, to the execution of the sophisticated consumer proposition that there's going to be much more significant adoption. And the companies that pursue that strategy are going to do a much better job of supporting their platform. And that's what this is all about at the end of yeah. the day. This is all about digital platforms, the penetration, and the stickiness of the services they provide to consumers. So do we, I mean, we've, we, we've talked about Google, we've talked about Amazon. Are there any, to move out of theory into reality, are there any services that you point out today, uh, be they access-based or licensed cloud lockers that, you t that you'd use as an example of how this can really resonate with consumers? Yeah, and so let me get back to the idea that we're not just talking about locker services and it's not an either or locker yeah. subscription. I think it's, it's very important to observe the pro proliferation of extremely high quality locker services and new combinations. And um, I have to note that the Curiosity service uh, recently launched by Sony um, it, it is a very sophisticated um, service. It's an interesting example of integrating two propositions. So you have a locker and a radio product and then an upsell yeah. to uh, unlimited on-demand subscription. And we think that that's a very logical two-tier combination to offer consumers. I believe your company, Omniphone, Well, I think we actually did actually negotiate that license with you, Michael. So <laughs> thanks for the compliment. Um, and so so there, I think that there, there's, some, there's some important new services in the market that get around the whole either-or idea. But uh, you, know, you have to give credit to... Um, um, a, a new generation of entrepreneurs that are very focused on software development that are executing sophisticated services, Spotify, um, RDO, Mog come to mind, um, Slacker, Deezer. There, there are a number of new services out there that are generating um, collectively you know, millions yeah. of new subscribers to music. And so uh, that's a very important development with the cloud. I mean, another executive said to me um, over lunch yesterday that actually in the music industry, this is the fastest growing sector of music revenues. Would you say that's correct in kind of percentage terms? It, it depends on the territory, but it certainly yeah. is, is growing quickly. We're, we're observing that. Um, you know, for example, in certain marketplaces, um, in, in Sweden, um, you've got two thirds of the entire digital marketplace wow. based in the cloud. And that's a marketplace that has largely you know, stabilized over the course of the last three years. So it, it, it's, it, it's a very significant development in terms of revenue growth, and, and we're certainly observing that. Now, something else that's happening with subscription that's really important is um, something that's referred to as strategic distribution or bundling. And what's happening is you know, the over-the-top players, the Apples, the Googles, the Amazons, the, the RIMs, uh, the, the, the Microsofts of the world, the Sonys of the world, are putting new services forward to consumers taking advantage of the network connectivity of the network operators, the network operators are worried about their position in the value chain. They, they see that there's an opportunity to capture a very important dimension of the consumer relationship through these kinds of services. So they're looking to package up subscription services yep. with network connectivity. And, and we see that bundling that's happening in a number of markets. Um, in the US, Cricket has uh, pioneered uh, a, a, a mobile music service um, with a, a, a data plan and a device. Uh, Orange in France with yeah. Deezer has done a tremendous job bundling that service. Uh, Telia with, with Spotify in, in Sweden, 24-7 um, being bundled yeah. uh, by TDC. Um, uh, I, I believe it's Canal Digital in Norway um, that's bundling the Aspira music service. Um, and then in Singapore, you're seeing AMP being bundled by Singtel. So we're seeing around the world the network operators focusing on strategic distribution. So I, that's a very, very significant development with, with respect to cloud services. Um, you know, then beyond that, I, I would say that the market transformation, I just cited uh, what's happening in, in Sweden, but look what's happening in Korea. A combination of three strikes defense, a proliferation of new uh, cloud-based subscription services, and you see a market that, that, that is um, growing significantly again. Um, it's way up from its low point in uh, 2005. I believe the market is, is up 40% from that point. So, th so we should be quite optimistic, really, about the future of the music industry, particularly in this region, then? Well, I have to be, because yeah. I'm a business development executive, <laughs> and I'm not optimistic. I, I, I don't know who's going to be the cheerleader here. But no, I, I think that you have the abstraction of what the cloud means, but, it, but it, it, it's a, a very, very powerful megatrend, as I said, that is going to drive a lot of new opportunity, and you see it being capitalized on with 
new services being introduced with new forms of strategic distribution. You see case studies of marketplace transformation. So and it's being done on a completely different scale to what it was done before as well. I mean, really large companies putting their, their weight behind this. Just one question, you were talking about the, the market in, in Asia. Uh, Sandy, our, our, our dear friend from Universal, was quoted in the, one of the Singapore papers this morning as saying they've had the best ever year, everything's rosy, fantastic profits. How, how are you seeing Asia Pacific right now? What's, what's, the, what's the music industry looking like this year and what are the challenges? Well, first of all, congratulations to Sandy. And <laughs> I have to say that we're certainly not above uh, learning from our competitors, and, and, and we know a number of, of areas of, of innovation of their business uh, in this region. I, I think that th this, th there's an amazing market opportunity that, that's happening right now related to um, this cloud transformation. There's been an explosion of uh, penetration of smartphones in this region. And the cloud is really ultimately all about dealing with the proliferation of mobile devices and providing a, a continuity of experience, providing an yeah. ecosystem um, that's persistent across those devices. And so I think you're going to see with the explosion of smartphones in this marketplace, there's going to be a great opportunity to introduce new cloud services. And I think in some instances where you haven't seen the digital download business take off, you're going to see a leapfrogging to digital 2.0 and to cloud-based services because of smartphone penetration. And that's, that's because of better user experience, because of app stores because of billing capability. I mean, to a degree, it's down to smartphones enabling the services to reach consumers in a way that wasn't possible with old J2ME devices. I absolutely agree. And again, another example of how we could be reversing roles and I could be asking you the questions. <laughs> That's an excellent so point. In terms of actually what we're going to see over the next five, 10, five, 10 years, I mean, today we're talking about a fast-moving marketplace, cloud services becoming bigger, smartphones opening things up. What, what will the music industry look like in five years? Are cloud services going to be 10% of the revenues? Are they going to be the majority of revenues? I mean, are we, what, what do you think is actually really going to happen? So I think the way to look at it is that the cloud is going to provide enhanced entertainment experiences for consumers. It's going to solve ecosystem problems that exist in a world of disconnected hard drives. So as I said before, I think you can migrate a lot more consumers to the cloud through their collections because you're addressing immediate needs. And there's every indication that there's mass market appeal to that proposition. I think once they're there, you can migrate them to yep. on-demand, unlimited subscription services. But I also think that you can sell them more downloads. If people wish to continue yep. collecting track by track, album by album, you've improved the experience of digital ownership by completing the ecosystem and making the content more valuable. And you've also established a relationship with the consumer where you see everything in their collection, but you also see what they actually consume. So database CRM should be much more effective in driving the download business. So the way that we look at the cloud is not, OK, well, this is a separate thing, and it means that uh, we're going to see 10% more revenue that's cloud-based revenue. The way that we look at the cloud is that it's transformative of the entire digital yep. music business and that it's going to drive the download business, it's going to drive the subscription business, and it's going to create a standalone revenue stream around the license locker service. Yeah. Okay, well, that sounds absolutely great. I think uh, all of us who are in the music industry are looking forward to being in a stage where the graph is following the right direction rather than the wrong direction. And I think we all would agree that it's great to see big companies now getting to this space and putting their muscle behind it. Well, I think uh, okay. we've kind of run out of time. So if I could ask you all to uh, uh, give a round of applause to uh, Michael Nash.